Well, as we've uh, been discussing today, we live in unprecedented times. Um, we have a huge challenge. Management is broken. Management is utterly and irretrievably broken. And it's too bad because we live in an amazing time. We live in a VUCA world and we've got massive acceleration technology with blockchain, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, nanotechnology, robotics, genetic engineering. Now we have 4D printing. We move beyond 3D printing, we now have 4D printing. And these massive changes are causing tons of anxiety and fear. And it's too bad because we also have unprecedented opportunities for innovation and breakthrough thinking. We can now digitize virtually everything, time, space, matter. We can go beyond the material, physical world to the digital world. We have augmented reality, realistic virtuality, virtual reality, warped reality, mirrored virtuality. There are a million ways to innovate. And yet, management is broken, irretrievably broken. And it's causing a lot of anxiety. IBM did a study complexity on complexity. They found that most leaders doubt their ability to manage complexity. It is hurting their own personal lives. They're losing sleep. It's a scary time. There's burnout, there's stress. It's a big challenge. But there's more. The management lab tells us that in the United States, for example, we spend $3 trillion a year on unnecessary bureaucracy. We are literally wasting people's lives with unnecessary permission steps, wasteful activities. It's not just an economic question anymore, anymore, it's a moral question. We are wasting people's lives. But that's not all. Engagement study after engagement study, whether it's Gallup or Blessing White or Dale Carnegie or any other consultancy or research operation tells us that Anywhere from two-thirds to three-quarters of workers are disengaged at work. Gallup says uh, over the last 18 years, about 30% of workers are engaged at work. That means 70% are disengaged. In the last study, 16 or so percent were actively disengaged, which means they're actively undermining their own workplaces through gossip, bullying, harassment, sabotage, and all the rest. Kind of a dark picture in some ways. It's very sad, given the tremendous opportunities we have. So is there a way to deal with this? Well, yeah, but we have a problem that's underlying all this, and that is that we still wrap our organizations around toxic dehumanizing language. We used to have personnel departments, and then in the 1980s we started talking about human resources. Henry Mintzberg famously said, I'm not a resource, I'm a human being. People are not resources. They're not direct reports, they're not file folders. We talk about man hours as if women don't exist. We talk about head count as if people are disembodied heads. This is dehumanizing language. And this is what undergirds all of the brokenness that we see in management everywhere in the world. Is there a way out of management purgatory? I believe there is. How about letting people manage themselves at work the same way they already manage themselves in their own personal lives? 
In our own personal lives, we all make gigantic, life-altering decisions without a boss. We decide who to date, who to marry, where to go to college, what to do for a living, whether to buy a house or a car, have children, or all the rest. Somehow, we make all these decisions without a boss. But it's only when we enter the portal of the workplace that apparently we're just too stupid to do anything without a human boss. Why is that? Can we let people manage themselves? D. Hawk, the founder of Visa, famously said that complex rules lead to simple, stupid behavior. Simple rules lead to complex, intelligent behavior. Can we create self-managed organizations based on simple, clear principles that create the no-limits enterprise? How many think we can? Okay. I believe we can. I know this is true because I was part of a core team that started a company called Morningstar. And we were working in a little farmhouse 30 years ago, exactly 30 years ago, in Northern California. And we had a tiny core team of 24 people, and I was the financial controller. And our mission was to build a state-of-the-art food processing facility. And so we came together, it was March of 1990, and our founder, Chris Rufer, brought us together and said, I'd like to have a, a meeting and talk about governance. So we said, great. So we all met that evening in a dusty construction trailer on the job site, and we sat around in a circle on steel folding chairs, and he handed out a document called the Morning Star Team Principles. He said, I propose we organize around two simple principles. The first principle is that human beings should not use force against other human beings. If you think about it, it's the foundation of all law everywhere in the world. And the second principle is that people should keep the commitments they make to each other. And that's also a principle of law, especially contract law. Mm -hmm. We discussed and debated these two principles for a couple of hours, and at the end of the evening, we just looked at each other and said, these make perfect sense. And so we adopted them as the governance of the enterprise. And when we walked out of the trailer, we were a self-managed enterprise. So we had a lot of work to do. March of 1990, we had thousands of hectares of tomatoes coming up out of the ground, up and down the state of California. We had hundreds of contractors on the job site 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, constructing and fabricating and welding. We had to hire hundreds of people to operate the factories and drive the trucks. We had equipment arriving on ocean cargo freighters from Italy in the middle of the ocean. But finally, on July 16th of 1990, we turned on the factory and we produced 45 million kilograms of industrial tomato concentrate for the world market and we changed the cost structure of our entire industry virtually overnight. We did it without a single human boss. No bosses, no designated managers, no supervisors, no titles. Human beings working together as team members cooperatively. We went on to grow. We built another factory and then another factory. We expanded operations up and down the supply chain toward customers and remote warehouses across North America, toward the supply in terms of farming and harvesting and transplanting and trucking. We became the largest tomato processor in the world, and everyone in North America at least has eaten our product. I believe all of you have eaten our product as well because we export worldwide. Now we have thousands of employees, a billion dollar company. We still live up to our two core principles. We have no human bosses whatsoever. We're a self-managed enterprise. The Harvard uh, Business Review uh, did a cover story 
on us in December of 2011. Gary Hamill wrote an article. We were described on the cover as the world's most creatively managed company. So how does this work? How can we truly create no limits enterprises based on simple principles? Well, the principles are key. If you think about the two principles I discussed, they are to human beings what gravity is to physics. They are the most fundamental principles of human interaction. Imagine a world where everyone abandoned the use of force. We wouldn't need armies or navies or police or locks on our doors. And we know that's not realistic, but that's not the point. The point is the closer we get to that ideal state, the more space we open up for happiness and harmony and prosperity and teamwork. Imagine a world where every single person did what they said they were going to do. What an amazing world that would be. And again, we know that's not r reality. That's not what actually happens, but that's not the point. The point is the closer we get to that ideal state, the better off we are as human beings, the more space we open up for happiness and harmony and prosperity. And by the way, keeping commitments has quantifiable economic and financial value. It's not just a good thing to do. Organizing around simple principles. This is our org chart. This is actually a, a frame from a time-lapse video which shows how we formed a cooperative network in our first factory. This is a dynamic hierarchy. It's not really a hi hierarchy, it's a dense network of peers, each of whom has an equal voice working together in a dense network of cooperative relationships. I am the blue dot in the upper left. This is our org chart, what it looks like. Now at Morningstar, we can use any tool, any practice, any system, any approach that we want to. We have no limits, zero limits. We use anything that works, as long as it's congruent with the two core principles. We can't force other people to use a system, and we have to keep our commitments. If I tell a colleague that I'll implement a lean manufacturing practice in part of a factory, I, I have an obligation to do what I said I would, was going to do. So there are no limits. We can literally use whatever works to accomplish the vision, the mission, the purpose of the enterprise. Unless you think that this one weird tomato company is the only company that's out there doing this, that's not true. How many have heard of the Hire Group? I just uh, saw the chairman, Jean Rumin, two weeks ago in California. Had a great conversation with him. He's taken the world's largest appliance manufacturer, 75,000 people globally. He's created 4,000 self-managed teams. Most of the teams are support teams, like IT and HR, and legal, but there are a number of customer-facing teams, and then there are innovation teams. And if they can create a new product or service, they can spin it off into a totally new company which Hire will then support. If I were a competitor of Hire right now, I would be very worried. I don't know how you compete, can compete effectively against a self-managed enterprise of that scale. Freshville is a brand new company. Uh, they're disrupting the convenience store industry around clean energy and healthy food and technology they adopted Morningstar's principles. And by the way, they can pay their people more because they don't have to pay the cost of bureaucracy. The Burt's Org is a home health care uh, business of 12,000 self-managed home health care nurses expanding all over the world. Jaipur Rugs in Jaipur, India. 
I was there in March. I met the founder, Nan Kishore Chowdhury. They make beautiful hand-woven carpets for the carpet industry. The carpets last for hundreds of years. Each carpet may have a million knots in it. They take like three or four months to produce each carpet. They call him the Gandhi of the textile industry. He has 40,000 carpet makers, mostly women from the untouchable class, distributed all over villages in India. Their lives are getting better by the day. And he is bringing self-management to every single one of those villages. And many of these people are able to educate their children for the first time ever and create better lives as a result of self-management. We don't have to look very far to see how to manage complexity with simplicity. Nature does a really good job of this. Double helix, two twisted strands of sugar and phosphate. Real simple. But the information contained within those two strands creates every single living thing on the planet. Just like two simple principles can create an entire billion dollar self-managed enterprise. So how do we get there? Well, I think there are some crucial elements in getting there, and we'll talk about this a lot uh, on December 2nd, back here at CRISP with a self-management masterclass. But I think there are some crucial elements here, and one is we have to sh embrace the reality of human nature. And that gets down to understanding the philosophy of human beings. And we have to share the vision of a desirable future state, invite people to co-create with us, and leverage the power of technology. So what does it mean to embrace human nature? I think we have to get back to philosophy and bring philosophy back into business. If you believe in free will, like Immanuel Kant, you will create organizations that acknowledge and respect the principle of free will. And if you believe in free will, it's nobody's job to motivate anybody else. And every single individual in an environment is responsible for his or her own training, education, and development. It's a completely different paradigm than the conventional top-down management system. Sharing the vision. As leaders, we have to articulate a vision of a desired future state and communicate that in a way that people understand it. So we can at least show people what we think is possible in a true no limits enterprise. I also think it's crucial to invite people to help us co-create. The principle of invitation is crucial to success. Trying to impose a self-managed system from the top down is a contradiction in terms. It cannot sustainably work. Once we articulate a vision, we have to invite people to share their ideas and to co-create alongside us to create a sustainable model for the future. And if we do these things, then I know from my experience at Morningstar and visiting with some of the most amazing leaders all around the world, that it's truly possible to create enterprises that are no limits. And as Peter Kessenbaum would say, we need to elevate our language and use transcendent language in order to touch people's hearts and invite them into this amazing future of a no limits enterprise. We need to go beyond teamwork to love. We need to go beyond mission to meaning. 
We need to go beyond collaboration to belonging. We need to go from empowerment to power. Thank you very much. One question. <laughs> I think actually we, there's nobody arriving there, so maybe, maybe two questions. Any takers? Hello, Doug. Hi. Uh, what do you think are some of the more common things that uh, block people for uh, taking action on what you're talking about? Uh, let's assume somebody who's sensing some something in those words that you've shared with us. Yeah, the the uh, the big blocker uh, from my perspective is the willingness of people to give up power. That's a big one. So if you read uh, Ian Robertson's book, The Winner Effect, How Power Affects Your Brain, uh, there is uh, some neuroscience and biology involved in the uh, thirst for power. And, and people often get a shot of dopamine in the brain when they exercise command authority over other people. And they become literally addicted to power. So persuading people that uh, lust for power or are addicted to power to give up power in the interest of a better world or in the interest of a no limits enterprise is a difficult task. And so um, we do our best and uh, we, uh, we work with leaders that are willing to work with us. Um, but uh, if someone is truly unwilling to, to cede power to other people, then um, it's probably not going to be a real productive exercise, at least in the short term. Hi. Um, you gave some really good examples of companies where this worked well, like Bootsorg and Hire. Um, do you also have examples where it didn't work so well or where it met with lots of difficulties? Um, yeah, I would say I, I've seen examples where um, a, 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 a leadership group thought this was an interesting concept and, and, and maybe sincerely uh, wanted to approach it, um, but didn't, didn't truly understand it or buy into it or uh, maybe just wanted to hang on to power. And so um, taking half steps uh, without truly believing that people have free will. That's why I think philosophy is so important. If you don't truly believe in the concept of free will and you, you still want to have some command and control, it, it's, you know, you can play with it, you can experiment it, with it, but it's really not going to work that well. And I've seen that happen. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Thank you. Token of our appreciation. Thank you.